I was born a real cockney yes, within I sound of Bow Bills in the Southampton Row on the site now occupied by I think all the Grand Hotel and Peter's Bar. It used to be when I was born a baker's shop and my mother and father had what are known as digs there. But my mother likes to dignify it now by calling it a high-class confectioner. <laughs> mm. Whether it makes my birth any more aristocratic, I don't know. But I must say that I have a very vivid memory of pre-14 London, which is a London all too sadly departed, and which, to me, even in our circumstances, had an enchantment which I'm afraid is fading from it now. We then went to live in Drury Lane, in a house which is still extant, and so I was immediately thrust in the middle of Covent Garden, opera and theatres, all the things that I've loved very much all my life. My grandfather first taught me the violin, but I was a very nervous, fidgety little boy, and as I practised, I would wander about from one room to the other, which irritated him immensely. He was a <laughs> dear old boy, but with a frightful temper, and he was just as capable one moment of bashing a fiddle over your head and taking you in his arms to go out and buy all sorts of toys for you as anything else. And one day, unbeknownst to anybody while I was practicing, he got into a handsome cab and went to a, a fiddle maker and arrived home with a quarter-sized cello. He sat me down on a chair put the cello between my knees and said, there, and now you'll have to sit down because <laughs> you can't practice this damn thing walking about. <laughs> and that's how I became a cellist. This conducting business, curiously enough, started when I was a very small boy, about the age of four. My father and grandfather shared the first desk of violins at the old Empire Theatre in Leicester Square, and my father used to take me to the rehearsals. I used to sit in the stalls, fascinated. And I think if I ever had any merits as an opera conductor, it's that I'd like the smell of size, which some people find objectionable from such an early age. And I used to be particularly fascinated by the conductor, who used to, in those days, always have white gloves on. I used to go home and shut myself up, lock the door in the room, I didn't want anybody to see me, and I used to sit on a little stool and sing tunes and steal a pair of white gloves of my sisters or my mother and imagine I was the conductor at the Empire. You know Lincoln's in Fields, the guard. Yes, there, yes, indeed, actually, yes, indeed. And there's still a little bandstand there. But in those days, every morning, a concert would be given about 11 to 12 by a police band or something band or other. And my grandfather was quite a gargantuan eater. He used to have a good breakfast at home. Then he used to take me ostensibly for a walk. But on the way to Lincoln's Inn, we lived a very few steps away. He'd buy himself a couple of large ham sandwiches. And we used to go and sit and listen to the band. And the chairs, I remember, were a halfpenny each. He'd have a halfpenny chair. I'd just walk around again fascinated by this man conducting the band. And I remember when the concerts were over, I used to go and stand reverently in the place where the conductor stood and hoping that one day I might reach this triumphant position of conducting in Lincoln's in Fields. <laughs> <laughs> I've played in theater orchestras. I've played in music halls. I remember once playing a pantomime at the old Surrey Theater. <laughs> Yeah. The main remembrance of that is the smell of oranges being peeled just by me. I've played in cinemas 
and I wish that the young orchestral player today could have such an experience. It was, of course, pre-talky days. They used to do what they call fit the picture. And some of these people were very clever at that. But you would go and deputize in the cinema and find in front of, on your music stand, at least 90 pieces of music. And you'd play till the conductor tapped, then you'd turn the next page, and you never knew what might be over the, the page. Suddenly find William Tell, poet and peasant, no small problems for a, a young cellist. But actually, the first professional engagement I got, I was 14 years old, and that was to play in the little orchestra in the pit at the Duke of York's Theatre. I remember that I didn't possess a pair of long trousers at the time. The family rushed out and bought me a hurriedly, very hurriedly, a pair of long trousers, which were far too long and which rather hurt under the armpits. I became the youngest member of the Queen's Hall Orchestra. Under Sir Henry Wood? Under Sir Henry Wood in 1916 and played the proms that invaluable experience for any young musician. Could you know we used to give six concerts a week and one rehearsal for each concert and the program lasted for three and a half hours. So it's obviously you couldn't rehearse everything and it was only uh, Sir Henry's wonderful workmanlike methods that pulled us through. But what an experience that was. Young Giovanni Battista Barbiroli went into the army and anglicised his Christian names to plain John. As he says, you can imagine what NCOs made of Giovanni Battista. The war over, he played in the orchestra at the Covent Garden Opera, became a solo cellist and a member of the International String Quartet. Then in 1926, he joined the British National Opera Company as a conductor. After some years, a new opportunity presented itself. It was during my opera appearances in Glasgow that the Scottish Orchestra invited me uh, as a guest. And I, there I began my symphonic career. I was a guest conductor for a few seasons and in 1933 I was appointed as permanent conductor and musical director of the orchestra when their fortunes were at a very low ebb. Yeah. I seem to be a kind of specialist <laughs> in, in uh, <laughs> resuscitating or reviving moribund organisations. Well, perhaps you should write a resurrection symphony. <laughs> Bravo. I think we must now pass to the next big stage in your exciting career, and that is that during your tenure of the conductorship of the Scottish Orchestra, you got this invitation to succeed Toscanini with the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. Yes, I must confess that uh, came as a bolt from the blue and gave me as much a shock as it did the rest of the musical world. Uh, of course, uh, at first there was a feeling of, I suppose, extraordinary exhilaration, followed by feelings of, I won't say doubt, but I'm not a <laughs> doubtful You're not man. a doubter, are you? No. no. They read, it was a tremendous task that since it had been given to me to undertake, I owed it to myself and to my family and to my friends to tackle it. But I must admit, I was further very much heartened in my resolve by knowing after all, some recommendations must have been made somewhere to lead to this, since I'd never been to America, when I knew that it was people like Chrysler, Rachmaninoff, Arthur Rubinstein, Heifetz, and others with whom I'd made many recordings, which had been hailed as, shall we say, rather lovely examples of collaboration between the soloist and the orchestra. I say that knowledge that these great men thought so highly of me certainly encouraged me to take on this seemingly impossible task. 